Hey everybody, welcome back outside the Woody Hayes Athletic Center where on Tuesday, Brian Day will have the first game week press conference of the 2022 season. Can't wait, wait to cover it with the podcast crew, Bill Landis, Jeremy Birmingham, I'm Austin Ward. What kind of Ryan Day do you think we're going to get on a Tuesday afternoon? Edgy, that's the word, edgy. right? Edgy, an edgy yeah. Ryan Day. Right. Yeah, he's going to growl a little bit, I think. Okay. Like yeah. that. I, don't, I think you're going to get a serious coach who is not going to say anything. Um, <laughs> you know, Ryan, <laughs> as Bill said last week, like he's gotten really adept at coach speak, which is something that when he got here in 2019, he was not good at. Uh, but it just shows how quickly these guys really – Look, hone their craft because he's become pretty adept. If you want to call it that, yeah. I mean, you don't you don't want him to say nothing, but at the same time, right now Ohio State has all this stuff in their favor, essentially heading into this game, and Notre Dame as the underdog with all of the the sparks that they're trying to generate between you know all these former Buckeyes in charge over there. Like you don't want to give them anything else to chew on, right? Mm. You, you should yeah. like. A uh, full off season worth of bulletin board material, or yeah, because Marcus Freeman did that on his own, right? And so, like, here we are, game week, and I think that the entire off season has been Marcus Freeman saying things that any coach shouldn't say, let alone a first year head coach about the school that you played for and the program that you could very well be the coach of in seven eight years. I like mean, it, he seems to be working pretty hard to make sure that there's a lot of option. weird things that he said. And I, I like Marcus Freeman. I know you're a big fan of his. It's just Marcus Freeman. It was guy. a bizarre offseason. And so I think we saw on Monday at his press conference with Notre Dame, he's trying to turn the narrative back to like, well, now we have bulletin board material because the Buckeyes are a favorite, even though that has nothing to do with them. Did, did, did Ryan Day set the betting line? Yeah, I don't think yeah. so. I don't think so either. I'm not yeah. sure that he pays a lot of attention to his point spreads. <laughs> uh, he's trying to win one game. I, that's It was an interesting thing. I, as you said, Broom, I've known Marcus Freeman for a very long time. I think very highly of him. I thought that he should have been Ryan Day's first defensive coordinator hire, which that wound up working out okay with Greg Madison and Jeff Halfley. So uh, point for Ryan Day on that regard. But um, I, I've found it the way he's handled the first six or seven months in charge at Notre Dame to be odd. He also talked about, you know, the Fiesta Bowl sticking with them for a very long time and losing to Oklahoma State the way they did. I just – that part isn't as weird as saying that your own college degree was worthless or having your tight Seems end – Seems like you got him a pretty good job. Yeah, having your tight end say or, – or the – what was the other one, the initial one? If I had to do it over, he wouldn't have come wouldn't to Ohio State. the same State. mistake twice. Yeah, yeah I, I, it's just, those things don't add up with the Marcus Freeman that I have always known. And I find that – I mean, you have to throw yourself fully into your new job, and I get that part. And there will always be part of him that won't be able to separate his allegiance to Ohio State. But I don't know, maybe if he was trying too hard to force that, that, hey, I'm here at Notre Dame and I'm going to endear myself to you, or if he's really just learning some of the things that he's not four years into it the way Ryan Day is, and to be more careful, purposeful with his words. I, I don't know. I know they did not play very well in this building behind him. Yeah, I just – he's like – to sound like a major homer, I suppose. You feel like he's unnecessarily poking the bear here a little bit. Like, it's not even, it, it is all that stuff, which, which was bizarre. And I, I don't want to speak out both sides of my mouth. Like, I, I like when coaches say things that are entertaining. So, like, I have been entertained by this. It's not to say that I find it a little bizarre. And maybe if I were a PR person said, like, hey, maybe don't do that. But then on top of that, he also, like, tried to hire every coach in this building when he took the job at Notre Dame, which is like, is that really what you want to do with the team you're playing in your season opener? Like, I don't well, know. It would make it easier. <laughs> I guess it would. I guess it would make it much easier if you just took everybody from the just staff. Just to do one thing, which is beat Ohio State in week one with, like, reading the whole staff. Okay. Yeah. No, we, should think, we should talk about that. How many okay. – let's just all do the count. Six, six different guys in this building that they tried to hire? Is that right? Uh, I know four off the top of my head on offense. Um there were also multiple staffers beyond that that weren't full-time assistant coaches that he tried to hire. Two, well, two on defense he tried, one that was successful. Yeah. I mean, there's only – it's a it's wild when you think about it, right? Okay, yes. He wanted to hire – let's just not dance around. Tried to poach Larry Johnson. Tried to poach Tony Alford. Tried to poach Brian Hartline. There were overtures Keenan about Keenan Bailey. That All these went nowhere, but – if their agents weren't involved to use Notre Dame to get a, a leverage for leverage for contracts for everybody else on the staff, what were they doing? 
because they were Notre Dame was handing out free money to Ohio State. Did he consider offering Ryan Day the offensive coordinator job before they hired Tommy Reese? Yeah. Well, that was the other you know fascinating dynamic was like one of Marcus Freeman's options was if Notre Dame didn't give him the job, then he was gonna well he did have an offer to be Ohio State's defense. Right. Coordinator. He very likely would have been here as the defense coordinator at Ohio State. So. I don't know. You look at it, and I wonder if if that off season of chirping is just a byproduct of again not knowing what you're not knowing. Ryan Day three years ago is the same guy who allegedly told Jim Harbaugh he was going to put 100 points on him on a conference call, right? So I think by, by allegedly you mean I did? Mean, I mean allegedly, <laughs> and he's using air quotes if you're not watching on YouTube. So that back that backfired on yeah. Ryan Day because they didn't get to play them in 2020 when they probably they would have scored, would have scored 100, 100 points against Michigan. But then the next year, Ohio State got embarrassed and Jim Harbaugh got to stand on top of the mountain and wag his finger. Hmm. Do you think that Marcus Freeman is doing this because he doesn't know better or because Jim Harbaugh had the offseason full of standing on the mountain and wagging his finger and it's just a good time to pile on? Everybody wanted to be on board yeah, with that. Maybe. I think it's more likely that he is really trying to rally the Notre Dame fan base and send a message to recruits, probably more specifically, that Notre Dame has a different edge and that the old guy is gone and that, that Brian Kelly approach didn't get them over the mountaintop and this is a new Notre Dame. Now, I don't really believe that that's the case personally. Uh, that'll probably be a running theme throughout this week that I don't believe that uh, Marcus Freeman has dramatically changed Notre Dame enough that they can be a contender right away. And I don't know that they're Recruiting success, it already seems to be receding a little bit, their recruiting success on the trail. Uh, I, I don't know how sustainable that is ever going to be until maybe Notre Dame joins a conference, which is another fascinating subplot of this whole game. If It, it felt like a lot of chess beating too early. And again, like, I don't know. I, I guess on one level, I'm in, I'm in favor of that. But, but because Marcus Freeman, I think in so many ways, is clearly different from Brian Kelly, like some of that sold itself. And I feel like he kind of undercut himself by, by doing some of this. And now, if he if the, the offseason that he had, all the things that he said, the way he kind of went about trying to build his staff and trying to poach people from here, and then if he goes out and like gets his butt kicked in Ohio Stadium, which is definitely on the table, that to me feels like a significant setback for a guy who's trying to get a program jump started. But if he pulls off the upset, yeah, yeah, then you, it's they start building the statue yeah. immediately. And I guess Sunday that's morning, the game. Right? I guess that's the game you play. But I, it seems much more likely to me that this is going to kind of blow up in his face a little bit. I think if he was, if Marcus was in his second job, he would say, "We're coming here to change the culture. It's not going to happen overnight. We're going to do this the right way. We have a huge challenge in week one and." and not try to build it that this is a massive opportunity and this Notre Dame locker room has a chip and I'm going to go take them the point spread, which they definitely didn't know about since they've been double digit underdogs since May when the first lines came out. Like, how does that really change anything? I don't just, it seems like an unnecessary approach, but he's also Marcus Freeman achieved things by being very aggressive throughout his entire yeah. career. I mean, well, that's how he got the job at Notre Dame, right? Yeah. I mean, he, he went into, the hiring process with nobody thinking he had a shot to be Notre Dame's actual choice. And then that, I'd assume, that sort of forward thinking slash bravado is part of the allure for Notre Dame, that they haven't really ever had a guy in that position who has this sort of personality, who's got the cojones to go out to the desert and throw a jersey at someone mm. in a commercial. Ooh. You know, that's... Whew, spicy. That was your favorite part of the offseason, I think. Without right? question, yeah. Spending I like that because that tens of thousands of dollars yeah, for a jersey review. Michael Mayer was in that commercial and uh, I think he's a really good player. And I, I think he should also not talk about stuff like Ohio State isn't going to be loud. I mean f folks, America, please. America. If you're, you, if you're an Ohio State segment. fan and you're coming to the Ohio State Notre Dame game on Saturday, I think you should be loud at the game. Do you think that they weren't going to be? I had my doubts until just now. Just when Michael Mayer said it's yeah. going to be. I, was that, is that really a thing? Like, No. Notre Dame. Is any of this really Notre a thing? Dame plays. <laughs> like, I don't know. I, that to me just feels like something. I don't. Th I didn't think that is a dig at Ohio State. No, I mean, I get it. He's saying, hey, man, uh, this is all football to me. It doesn't matter where I What's play. he supposed to say? Right. I mean, exactly. But that's the whole. I need to go change my shorts. Whole, <laughs> we're playing in Ohio Stadium. <laughs> that's the whole dumb shtick of all 
trailer uh, trash talk, right? Like you're like, hey man, you guys aren't as good as people say you are. But like, <laughs> he wouldn't even know, right? I mean, how would he Michael? Wouldn't. He's never played a game here, right? He's never yeah. been here, and he's also a sophomore, <laughs> so he's not played very many college football games right, in yeah. general. I mean, I appreciate his <laughs> his swagger. I think he's a really good player. I think he's probably the second best tight end in the country. If he was coming into this game saying, "I'm terrified to play at Ohio State." Like, I think you have a bigger problem at Notre Dame, right? That would be bad. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's fine for him to be confident. I don't I don't put a lot of stock into that. I, Ohio Stadium is going to be extremely loud on Saturday night and probably properly lubed up since it's not a noon, noon I've heard, banger. I've heard heard a lot of land grand beers going to be on the premises. Is that right? Yeah. Well, that's a good chance of that. I might try to sneak one in myself. Oh, wow. Ooh. Wow. Now we're getting – now he's getting saucy. <laughs> We've got Ryan Day. We've got Jim Knowles and C.J. Stroud at the podium in this building. We uh, think. On Tuesday afternoon. Allegedly. Pretty sure. <laughs> Pretty sure. Yes. We talked on Monday on the podcast today about what we want to see from Ohio State at the game on Saturday. Mm-hmm. We did this last week. What do you want to hear on Tuesday? I think we just heard from Jim Knowles. I, I'm not sure what else is left. I'm not suggesting that Jerry cancel that availability. Well, we have to know if they got that extra 25% of the defense put in. Are they all the way to 100? Yeah. Wait a minute. I'm just asking for everybody else. Like Jim Knowles had specifically said, I don't ever want to get to 100%. And then people are like, how much longer is it going to take to get 25%? (laughs) He asked like five questions about how long it's going to take for 100%. Like he doesn't, he said he doesn't want 100%. (laughs) Where do you want to stop then? Like 98? 98. I. I don't 90, know the right six point five. I don't know. He said he wanted to keep some things in his pocket, only things that were only in his brain. And sometimes I just feel like there's not enough attention paid in that room to people's actual words. So what do I want to? <laughs> what do I want to hear? I want to hear questions that prove people are paying attention. That's a good one. That's a challenge to the rest of my colleagues, and I'll have to take mm-hmm. it as well. Sometimes I ask questions that may be rehashing things. But I at least want to know that I am responding to a previous answer. Yeah, correctly. that's that's a good one. I I don't really feel like there's much left for me to hear. Like I'm ready for them to play the game over there on yeah, Saturday. Yeah, I'm so ready. Uh, like, I, I, like Berm said, this off season feels like it's been incredibly long. Um, I'm I'm interested in their demeanor. Like you said with Ryan Day at the top, what's it going to be like? Like I. I wonder if they're going to be like pretty buttoned up business, like pretty short because they're ready to get in Ohio Stadium on Saturday. So I'm thinking maybe it's not an all that eventful week of interviews, which is fine because the sooner we can get to the game, the better. No, I would like to hear that they have their seven offensive linemen set, locked in and ready to go. I'd okay, like to, fine. You want to know real things? Yeah, Great. I'd oh. like to know. Cool, if, I'd like to know if Josh Fryer is offensive lineman six, no matter where it happens, other than center, probably. I think that I'd like to know that. And then who's behind him? Is it going to be Enoch Mamahi? Is it going to be someone else stepping up uh, that we've seen guys moving up the chart? And on defense, I guess I want to know how. Come on, Chris Fowler. What's Chris Fowler's depth chart? Okay. Now we know I, <laughs> this was America. people. America. <laughs> I'll let Austin take this one. America. Let me let you in on a secret. Chris Fowler does not have an official Ohio State depth chart. If he had one. It wouldn't have had Mitchell Melton's name on it. Right, Mitchell Melton, for those of you unaware, uh, tore his ACL in April and is missing the entire season. So he's certainly not the third jack option for Ohio State on this team. America, when ESPN is doing a game, they're going to make a best guess. They're going to li- line up what positions people are likely to be at. Sometimes they do get official depth charts. Other times, it's just one of Chris Fowler's assistants, spotters, putting the names down on there for him so that he can learn them. It does not mean that Sonny Styles is the backup. Uh, what's Free adjuster? safety. Yeah, adjuster. 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 Yeah. It does not mean that Lathan Ransom is the third string nickel. In fact, if Lathan Ransom is third string anything, I will... What should I do? Eat your foot. I will eat... A f- I don't know how. Look, Ohio State will it's probably t- <laughs> give Chris Fowler a depth chart on Friday. But certainly not one a week ahead of time, and certainly not one that had names on it that were just. They, uh, that was a situation where I think ESPN, as as our good friend Austin Ward just told us, uh, was just trying to predict. And if you happen to notice, the five the the freshmen that they put on there were the five stars, the guys that everyone's like, oh, we have to talk about this guy in case he gets in. And I think that's 
just the reason you do it. It's not because there's any real expectation that CJ Hicks is the backup linebacker to um, the Steel Chambers. I'm glad you brought that up. That's I, I'm. So is Cameron not, Brown not going to start a cornerback then? I mean, it doesn't mean that everything they wrote down was wrong. It just means that it didn't come from Ohio State. Yeah, it's like me writing a depth chart on rivals. I'm just making stuff up. But yours was but it's informed. based on actual information. I'm very curious where some of this information came from because yeah, uh, out there. that's not the depth uh, chart. Again, I think it had to have just been look at the recruiting rankings and say, who are the guys that if the young guys get in, that you have to have something to say about because like, well, they didn't have chip training at linebacker, right? Like what, right. what did they have? Uh, they had CJ Hicks. As he, the, he like wasn't even on there, right? Yeah. I didn't see yeah. his name on. Yeah. Also that's wrong. Last thing I want to ask before we end this episode of the podcast daily for Tuesday, uh, August 30th is bill. Did you get a chance to get a hold of Bryce Harper and work things out? Because I was a little worried on Monday uh, that maybe there was, you know, a, a rift I, developing. I'm worried that that came out wrong. I don't, I don't, I don't want the word to get back. I did say that I would die for him. Like did, I want that to be clear. That's true. He's going to deliver a World Series to the city of Philadelphia. The only way you could die if, for him is if, in this moment, you dove in front of the bus that you tried to throw him on. Yeah, I think oh. that's probably right. I would, I would like to uh, apologize to Bryce, Mr. Harper. Um, I would, I would love for you to, to come on the podcast sometime. We'll talk about the Bucks, so I know you're a lifelong fan of. That's right. It's very important to get that out there. Yeah. I hope that that Feels olive good. branch works out in your favor and that he does appear on the podcast and daily. Maybe if you want to sign some cards that I have, all the better. <laughs> Which No stickers. Yeah. <laughs> on card, PSA authentic. I'll just say like F you on them. Yeah. Was there anything else? That you no, had that's all mind? I had in mind. I was just worried about Bill. And, Thanks, and man. Bryce. I appreciate that. What was your favorite Jack Harlow song? Uh, definitely the one where uh, I don't. Know. Yeah, they're all so good. No, I was your is your favorite uh, Jack Harlow movie, uh, Curse of the Black Pearl, or <laughs> Dead Man's Chest? Dead Man's Chest. Yeah, person. okay, yeah, me too. He's great in that movie. As far as pirates go, like Jack Harlow might be the best of all the pirates that were ever on the Caribbean. Captain Jack Harlow coming to you in the horseshoe on Saturday night. Can't wait. Well, that's I guess Saturday morning. Wake up early. Get down. <laughs> To get, you're going to be awake. 9.30 a.m. Jack Harlow. Who's ready? That's going to be an absolute <laughs> banger. That's uh, one day closer. This is the Podcast Daily. Super weird ending. As always, we hope you enjoyed it. Mixed in a little bit of football before that. That's Bill Burm. I'm Austin. We will see you tomorrow.